you can turn to Acts chapter 1, and uh, that's where we're going to be today. And I just want to talk a little bit um, about what God has laid on my heart. So, so how God works with me uh, as a pastor is what he does is he, months, months before I even preach about a topic, he's, he's trying to convict me uh, of, the, of, of the topic, uh, trying to get my heart in sync with his heart. And so that starts like months before I'm, I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm starting to get emotionally connected to what God is trying to do to the point that I want to, I need to preach this. And, and every time it never fails, uh, when it's time to preach that message, it's the, the perfect time. It's the, it's the right time to preach that message. And that's no different from today. So I'm just going to give it to you and then we'll, we'll go through what, uh, what I actually mean by what I'm about to say. And so here, here it is right here. God's people are not equipped for the times that they find themselves in because we do not know God as we should. Now, here's what I mean by that. Um, and, and first, that's not God's fault. God has done everything that needs to be done. He, he's kept his side of the bargain. First Peter uh, one, verse three, God has by his divine power given us everything that we need to have a godly life. God has done what he's supposed to do. Ephesians chapter four, he gives us gifts to uh, verse 11 to build up the ministry of the work of God, right? He's done everything that he has to do. What happens is, is that God's people are not walking in the, let's just say the tools that God has given us, the power that we have access to. I was convicted of this uh, in 2016 uh, during the race riots. Um, and then right after that, 2020, when COVID hit. And I remember before 2016, before 2020, everybody was like super Christian, right? Uh, do y'all remember that? Uh, the Christianity was on the rise. We were standing on the promises, brother, right? We were, we were saying all that stuff. Uh, I wish Satan would try something with my church. Do you remember that? And then what, and then what happens? Well, when it came time to stand on the promises, man, Satan rocked the church, did he not? I mean, people, the church lost its identity, its purpose, and some churches even forgot the gospel was. All of that is because we do not know who God is, and because of that, we are unequipped for the time that we live in. And I want to show you why, what I mean by that. If I was to say to you, who is God the Father? You would say, man, God, the father, he's the loving God who God is love. He loves us so much that he sends his son, Jesus Christ, to die for sins that he didn't even commit. Absolutely. Then I'd say, well, well tell me about this Jesus Christ. And you say, I, I can tell you about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is everything to me. He is the son of God. He's the second member of the Trinity. He died on the cross for sins that he did not commit. And the Holy Spirit rose him from the grave. Absolutely. And then I would say, okay, well, tell me about this Holy Spirit. And then that's when you'll get the crickets, right? You might get some theological jargon of God is uh, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity, something like that. But typically you're going to get crit uh, crickets or you're going to get debate. Somebody's going to want to debate about tongues. Someone's going to want to debate about healings. And here's what you have to understand. The Holy Spirit is not an idea that we just is that's here for us just to debate. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity that we are to be worshiping and be in relationship with. And when we are not. How can we ever do what Jesus tells us to do, which is Acts chapter one, which tells us to be witnesses for him? We don't we don't have the power to do that. And sometimes we don't even have the the will to do that, if you will. I don't know about you, but I believe America has been judged by God. And, and here's what I mean by that. Sometimes how God deals with nations, if you will, 
is that when he has judged them for their lawlessness and their wickedness, what he does is he lets them destroy themselves. We saw this with the Romans. Uh, we've seen this all throughout history as well. It's not always going to be lightning coming down from heaven. Sometimes God is just like, hey, I'm just going to let you have what you want. Have the sin that you want, and I'm going to let you destroy yourselves. And typically, it's through civil war. Now, I don't know if you've not been watching the news lately, but the powers that be, they want us to have a civil war. They want this country divided. They want us just to destroy ourselves. But even in the midst of that, God is behind the scenes still judging the nation. And even in the midst of that, God requires for his people to still, to still be on mission. But here's what happens. We get distracted. And a funny thing that we do is, though we're distracted and not on mission, we just keep on doing the same thing over and over again, even though we're not seeing any type of results. And here's why that is crazy. Have you thought, we talk a lot about the mission. We sing a lot about mission, which is awesome. We should. But have you really thought about what the mission is? The mission is a supernatural work. And here's what I mean. God works through us to bring men and women from uh, natural hearts that are turned against God. And then these these hearts miraculously, right, through the gospel preaching of the word, right, the gospel witness goes to a heart that that loves God. That is a that is a a work of grace. That is a, a miracle. Do you understand that? That's a that's a miracle when that happens. And here's what I want you guys to understand. It's supernatural. And God has given us a supernatural mission. Get this. Supernatural mission requires supernatural power. It requires supernatural power from high. So that's what we're going to be talking today about. If you noticed Paul, if you're reading the New Testament, Paul, he's 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 always saying to the church in the beginning of his greetings, he's saying, hey, here are some things that I'm praying for you. I've heard that you're doing great. I've heard about your love and your faith. And here are some things that I've been praying for you. And I think he does this all in his epistles. But one of my favorites is actually Ephesians chapter one. I'll, I'll read it for you where Paul kind of brings everything together that he prays for all the churches. He prays for the church of Ephesus. And if you watch the video that I sent you this week, I've, I read it before or during that video. But here it is. Ephesians one. Verse 18, Paul says this, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then verse 19, he says this, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Paul wanted all of the churches that he planted and and all of the Christians throughout history to truly understand the power that we receive when we become Christians. He wanted all the churches not to be walking in their own strength, but understand there's this power that you have access to. Paul knew that when people would stop working from the power of God, well, what would happen is then that our Christian influence in the world, if you will, well, it would suffer. It, it, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be any power. And so he wanted the church to be, hey, He wanted the church to be truly dependent on the Holy Spirit. When I found out yesterday that Trump got shot, uh, I was actually uh, downstairs. The band was up here rocking out and I was trying to get work done, but I was also dancing. And then I I saw that they um, that happened. And I came upstairs and I told him, like, you know, Trump just got shot. Taylor was like, no way. (laughs) I was like, I'm not. That just happened. But before that happened. Before I came up here, before before I when I saw that Trump had been shot, the first thing that hit my mind was Mordecai, Esther's cousin. Do you remember that what he says to her? He says to her, hey, you're 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 super comfortable right now when someone's trying to take out the Jews. You should be concerned about this. Do you remember he said that? And then what does he say? He says, what if God has placed you in that place for a time? What? Like such as this. Well, my, that's my message for y'all. What if God has placed us in a time such as this? And here's the here's the point. He has. He has. So I want us to truly get acquainted with the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. So if you could turn, if you're already there in Acts chapter one, I want to read that. I want to pray. And we're just going to dive in 
to this text. Acts chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 4. And while staying with them, this is Jesus, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. You might want to underline that word, my, my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's pray. Father, the supernatural power that I speak of, that your word speaks of, um, that can only be given to us from you. Jesus, I ask for it. Father, may we be a church that is dependent on your spirit, dependent on your power. Um, first and foremost, that we come to you with all of our, our needs and our wants, um, knowing that you are with us in the midst of a dark, dark time that we live in right now. So, Father, I ask for your power from on high, the power that you have given us that is available to all who profess your name. I call this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit, as I said before in the intro, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit, as you know, our God is three persons who are one, not one God revealing himself in three different ways. No, it is three persons, but they are together. One is God, third member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of God or the, the power of God. And where we see the Holy Spirit, first time we see is in uh, Genesis chapter one, where we see the spirit is hovering over the face of the waters, right? The next time we see the Holy Spirit, we see the Holy Spirit uh, coming upon people for a certain work that God has for them. We, we saw the Holy Spirit come upon Samson and he rips a lion in part, apart, among some other things that he did. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit coming upon Saul and he, he prophesies. We see the Holy Spirit coming upon David and, um, um, and it actually departed from Saul. And, and the Spirit falls also on uh, certain prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Now this fall, that happens of the Holy Spirit upon a person, uh, it's for that a season, if you will, but it doesn't stay. We see it fall upon Mary as she gives birth to the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And then we see the Spirit actually fall on Jesus. In Matthew 3.16, it reads, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. And get this. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. When Jesus begins his ministry, he begins the ministry with the Holy Spirit falling upon him before he starts to work. The son of God waited for the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. And I believe that is because Jesus knew that what God the father had called him to do required supernatural power. Jesus understood the concept of power. And and so do we. We understand the concept of power, too. Like when I moved here, I noticed that New England grass grows faster than any other grass in the world. Right? You cut it and it starts growing while you're cutting it. Does it not? I've, I've never seen anything like it. It, it infuriates me. And um, around here, you got to like stay on it because neighbors start judging you. It's like, seriously, it, it happens. And so I'm always like freaking out about that. And um, what if you, though, went out, looked out your window and you saw a neighbor cutting their grass, 
but they didn't crank that bad boy or put any gas in it. They're just rolling over it. <laughs> and then what if they're super baffled why the grass is not cutting? <laughs> why it's not being cut? Like what if they're like, what's going on? That's silly, right? The church does that. And here's what I mean, that the church does this. How often do we continue to try to do what God has called us to do without power? And then instead of acknowledging that, I think pride gets in the way of that, but instead of acknowledging that, we're just baffled like, hmm, well, maybe if we just do it harder or do it longer. And it's, you get what I'm saying? It's still getting the same results. That's, that's, that's no different from a neighbor trying to cut the grass with no power. So let's, let's look at Acts chapter 1. So here's what's happened leading up to Acts chapter 1. Jesus, he has died on the cross for the past, present, and future sins of the world. Uh, he's resurrected, and he's about to ascend. In the middle of that is 40 days. And, and, and he spends those 40 days with the apostles uh, speaking about the kingdom of God. Before he told the apostles he was leaving, he gave them a promise. John 16, verse 6 through 7 says this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, we get to, that's John 16. We get to Acts chapter 1. And verse four says, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father. And he and says in verse five, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, he says, wait for the, 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 the power that he waited for before he began his mission. He says, wait for the power, the same power that actually rose him from the grave. Jesus says, wait for that power. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So here's the question. What does that mean? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's always going to be a lot of controversy around this topic when it shouldn't be. But also those who come to this topic and are very controversial about it, if you spend a little time with them, typically they're not familiar with the order of events surrounding Jesus's earthly ministry, or they're not familiar with what the Holy Spirit actually does. So I want to give you an example of this. In John chapter 20, verse 21 to 22, Jesus has resurrected the apostles are hiding. They're scared for their lives. And Jesus appears in the room with them. John 20, verse 21 through 22 says this. The resurrected Jesus appears to the apostles and says this. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this is John chapter 20, and we're in Acts chapter 1, where we just read in Acts chapter 1 that the apostles were told they needed to wait for the Spirit, um, though we just read in John, they had already received the Spirit. So what's going on here? Well, there's two views that often come up with this topic, and I'm going to give them to you, and I'll tell you my view, and I'll prove my view. One view is that the Spirit did not come upon them at that moment, but Jesus gave them a pledge that they would soon be endowed with the Holy Spirit and with power from on high. So basically, they're at the table. Jesus says, hey, you're going to get the Holy Spirit, and then he blows on them. I'm going to, yeah, I, I struggle with that one. Um, I, I, I was thinking, I think all around the world, that's just weird, right? Just another man, just, you do, you do, that get me, in my family, you're going to get beat up. <laughs> you just, just, but um, nevertheless, that's one view. Here's the view that I hold. It's that the reception of the Holy Spirit in John 20, 20 22, when he blew on them, was a temporary feeling of the Holy Spirit until Pentecost in Acts 2, 
like with Samson, Elijah, Saul, David, and Solomon, as it happens often in the Old Testament. We know that for someone to believe, the spirit must work in their hearts. We, no one's going to sit here and say that these apostles were not Christians. But often we say, if you're going to be a Christian, well, the first thing that has to do, you have to believe, and then the spirit comes inside of you. Well, we see that not happening right here. What we see is that the spirit has been working in their hearts. They've come to know who Jesus is. Uh, Matthew 16, Jesus, remember Jesus says to Peter, who am I? Jesus says, you're the son of God. And, and Jesus says, hey, hey, don't be too prideful. You didn't come up with that yourself. The Holy Spirit told you that, right? So the Holy Spirit has been working in their lives all through this time. But now he, what has happened is he's given them power. The permanent indwelling of the spirit that continuously fills them with power. Well, that hadn't happened yet, but it was going to happen. And we see it happen in Acts chapter two. And what really kind of as I studied this for years now, what really kind of pushed me over the top where I suck on my proof text is that a couple of things. Peter, he's filled with the spirit and he preaches and 3000 come to know Jesus He's, he's filled with the spirit and he heals a man. And when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes up, the problem is often the topic always comes up about comes or goes to tongues and goes to healing and the sign gifts. But often what you see with the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the text is that what it does is it strengthens you and empowers you to witness. Do you get what I'm saying? That the Holy Spirit, when it comes upon the apostles, the next thing that we see often is that they are ready to go for Jesus. They are bold. Remember, Peter is bold. He went from denying Christ to standing up in, in front of the, the whole about 3000 people proclaiming Christ. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit does. When someone is filled with the spirit, they're bold. Um, we see this really clearly in Acts chapter eight with Philip. Philip, he's called to be a deacon. And what we what do we know about the deacons in Acts chapter six? They had to be filled with the spirit. Well, Philip, what he does is he's sent down to Samaria and he preaches the gospel down there. And people are saying, I want to read it to you. Acts uh, eight, 12 through 13. But when they believed as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized as is speaking of the Samarians, both men and and women. And then verse 13 in chapter eight says, even Simon himself, remember Simon, the magician, uh, magician, he believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and he was seeing signs and great miracles performed. And he was amazed. Then when you get to verses 14 through 17, it says, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John who came down and get this, prayed for them, these believers, this is what they prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. What, what this is teaching us is that we need to be saved, of course, but we need to live lives that are filled continuously with the spirit. It's not just this one time thing where we're just out here on our own, just hoping that we make it through. We need the spirit's power every single day of our lives. And we see this all through Acts. Unfortunately, some mistakenly say baptism of the Holy Spirit is about salvation. In other words, you're not a Christian if you're not speaking in tongues or healing and doing all of these things. And unfortunately, that is that is a false teaching. God, he requires for us to obey him. He requires for us to love him and to serve him. And, and we need the spirit to do that. But you can you can quench the spirit. You can grieve the spirit. You can do all of these things. We are saved by grace through faith, not by our works. That's why we reject that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is this type of second work you're waiting for to truly be a member of God's family. No, that's not what it teaches. What it teaches, though, is that we do need to continuously fill, be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. And the mission today 
It requires people who are dependent on the Holy Spirit when we go out to be salt and light in this dark generation. And you have to remember, as you look at the Holy Spirit in chapter one of Genesis, it's hovering over the face of the waters. There's darkness. And then what? Through the word of God, the spirit brings light. Is that not salvation? That is that not what happens? In fact, uh, Paul speaks about this in Second Corinthians four, verse six. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is not through works, but it's through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. So when we let's jump back into Acts verse one, I want to just just deal with that to see what's happening right here. So we're back in Acts chapter one, verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? After these things, Jesus had taught them and everything they had seen. Excuse me. After Jesus has taught them and everything that they have seen, and that includes Jesus resurrection. What we see with the apostles here is that they are still desiring a couple of things. The apostles are still desiring respect and honor. They're still desiring, I would say, revenge. They're still desiring, if we want to put it all together, they're desiring comfort. So when they see Jesus, they say, will you now finally restore Israel to its proper place in the world? And Jesus says to them in verse seven, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. I want to ask you a question. Why? Why do we Christians not know when the exact date that Jesus is coming back? No one knows. No one wants to answer. OK, check this out. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah, he doesn't want us to know that's that's yeah, that's right. OK, so let me let me just let me ask you this question. Another question. Can you imagine if we did know when Jesus was coming back? Have you ever thought about that? If we actually knew when Jesus was coming back, let's take a survey. Raise your hand if you believe things would be better if the church would be better in the church if we knew when Jesus would be back. No one wants to raise their hand. Yo, raise your hand if you believe the church would be worse off if we knew the exact date that Jesus was coming back. I want I want you to think if you if you just didn't want to raise your hand, but you think we would be better off if Jesus was coming back. I want you to think about when you were a kid. And your parents would say, you have one hour to clean your room. Better be clean when I get back. You know what I heard when I was a kid? I have 58 minutes to play my video games. <laughs> and I have one more. You know, I have plenty of time. And in the midst of that, I made things dirtier. I made things worse because the focus wasn't on the work. The focus was on the time. That's the issue I have with the. The watchers of the day. And I know I have some of you out there, so don't throw anything at me. All right? I just have to say this. We, we've done a, a lot of damage by, and, and no one's done that here, but I, I know some people. Y'all remember when that guy had the, the posters up saying Jesus was coming back like that year? Remember that? Man, like y'all might not know, but I know people that really believe that. And of course it didn't happen and, and whatever, but the guy made a little bit of dough. Um, but uh, and there's been a lot of guys that have done that, but we've seen a lot of damage done by people proclaiming to know when Jesus comes back. But the biggest problem, I think, is that desiring Jesus to come back is not an issue. But being a watcher today is different for some people. It's not just desiring for Jesus to come back. Uh, we should desire to Jesus, for Jesus to come back and understand the times we live in. But for many people, they are determining the times. And like kids, they're not focusing on the work. Does that, does that make sense? Um, I know people with great minds when it comes to eschatology, like, wow. And it's, it's just great. But when you look at the church, their, the, their church life, right? And you look at how are they engaging in, in the mission of the church? Well, it's usually lacking. It's lacking power. And then I also add a lot of those people live in fear. You know, they've, they've done the work, they've studied Revelation, and they've studied it so much that they're hiding in their closets. It's true. It can be scary when you, you think about the work that God has called us to do. It, it really can. And I don't want to make light of that. But I believe that though all of those are reasons why the father has kept the dates from us. Because you imagine how lazy 
and unfruitful we would get if we knew the exact day when Jesus was coming back. Jesus tells them in verse eight, hey, you need to stop focusing on that. Jesus says, stop focusing on when I'm coming back. Uh, stop focusing on when uh, uh, the kingdom of God is going to be present. And he says in verse eight, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I have this quote from David Platt. Doug, you have that, that, um, that first slide. Uh, David, David says this. He says, think about the God who created the Grand Canyon. Hope you can read that. It's kind of small. So this God and all of his power who created the Grand Canyon has put his spirit inside of me and inside of you. That will just knock you out of your seat if you really think about it. The power of God's spirit living in us and the purpose is clear. He's given us his power so we'll be his witnesses so that we will testify to who he is to make him known in the world around us, not just around us, but everywhere to the end of the earth so that every follower of Christ has been given the power of the spirit for the display declaration of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Have you bless you. Have you have you thought about that? The God who made the Grand Canyon I would replace that with the God who raised Jesus from the grave. That power is inside of us. We know the Holy Spirit is still working today and he's working in miraculous ways. And I'm and I'm not going to deny that because of some type of denominational uh, allegiance, if you will. God is doing miracles. He's still working today. And we know that. But to make light of what God does, what the spirit does on the regular is also a problem as well. And here's what I mean. The Holy Spirit, it empowers us to do what we need to do during the time that we actually live in. And I'm going to read this list to you and tell me that your heart doesn't just respond to this as like, Lord, we really need the, the power to do this today. And, and, and Jesus is like, yes, that power is available to you. Let me show you. Here are some of the things that the, the Holy Spirit does. Uh, that'd be the next slide. The work of the Holy Spirit. What does it do? Well, it convicts the world of sin and righteousness. Luke 4, 14 through 15, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country and he taught in the synagogues being glorified by all. When, you, the, the, when the Holy Spirit, when you're working in the power of the Holy Spirit, it convicts hearts. Sometimes we're like, man, why isn't, People getting saved. And what is this? We're not praying. We're not trusting in God. We're trying to manipulate people into the kingdom. We're trying to use apologetics people into the kingdom. Man, I, always, I used to think, man, I used to think all the time Well, when I was a, in Bible college, um, young Christian, I was like, honestly, if we could ever just get a plane up there, where, where, where is uh, the ark at? What, what mountain is that? Bible college students? Say it again. Man, we could just get a plane up there. They see the ark. Everybody's going to get saved in a discussion. No, no, that's not that's not it. Right. This, this is the message that Jesus gave us that um, they have. The t they remember they, they, what he told the, uh, the rich man who wanted to go back to his brothers and sisters. He didn't want them to come to hell. What was the response? <laughs> They're not going to believe. Right. It's, it's a it's a power. It's a miracle that happens that comes upon a person and they, they hear the same words that everyone in the room is hearing, but they hear it in their hearts and they choose Jesus. It's a miracle. It's supernatural power. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and righteousness. The Holy Spirit gives guidance. John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Ephesians 4, chapter 11 says this, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. It so amazes me that churches have looked at that verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, particularly. And they're like, you know, instead of studying it and, and trying to see, well, what does that mean? What does that look like for today? What is how is a prophet today different from the Old Testament. What does it mean? Instead of doing any of that work, they've said, nah, 
we don't, we don't need any of that. We're, 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 we're good. I mean, as long as we just come to church, wear suits, sing a couple of songs, got the right Bible translation, we'll be okay. Like, how, the Holy Spirit guides us in the times that we live in. And, and here's something, guys. Like, seriously, like, I'm saying this all the time, and I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it to our annual meeting and everything. Like, that verse, what it teaches is that if you're a member of this church, you have the Holy Spirit living in you. God has given you gifts to help us accomplish the mission that we're trying to do uh, unified, if you will. Does that make sense? And, I, and I've been trying to like just plug that into your head is that like, guys, like you're not going to save Belmont just by my preaching. <laughs> right. That's hard to say. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, <laughs> like, do you like, man, I don't want to make light of this. Like, do you understand? I, I need you. Like the spirit needs you to understand your gifts. Sometimes I'm going to, we're going to be a day when I'm going to, I'm going to be laying on the front pew needing encouragement. Where's the encourager at? Where's the, where's the healer at? Where's the, where's the prayer at? Where's that person that just has faith? Like in the midst of a dark generation, that's going to remind the pastor of what he preaches when he forgets it. Do you get what I'm saying? That is how God is. He's given us a spirit. You need to know your gifts. But yeah, yeah, guidance. The Holy Spirit guides us today. And then to glorify Jesus, John 16, 14, we, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare to you and declare it to you. And then Acts chapter 4, 33, and with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all, which leads to another truth in this dialogue um, before we close out. And I told you to underline the word my. So Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. What that means is that we're not called to spread our form of Christianity and to make much of ourselves. And here's what I mean by that. Our nation is filled with pastors who I would say get on stage every Sunday and they've decided what version of Christianity that they like. And they've gotten on stage and or, or developed it. Maybe they developed a version of Christianity that they like and they get on stage every Sunday and they preach whatever they want and they say whatever they want to say. And that ministry is not powered by the Holy Spirit. And it always ends with a fall. Right. We know this. We are to be his witnesses. It's his church. It's his power. What that means is I need to be filled with the spirit. I need to be reading the word. I need to be praying. I can't get up here and just represent Jesus any type of way. For we are ambassadors. You, you get what I'm saying? So I don't come to the text and be like, I have an idea. Let me find some verses that'll go with that. No, no, I don't do that. I don't say, well, you know what? Maybe we should, maybe we should do this and whatever. I'm just, we're trying to win souls. No, we are ambassadors of Christ. It, we are his witnesses, his Christian, Christianity. We are his soldiers. We are his people. He leads the church. If you're wondering who my boss is, right? It, this is Jesus's church. You, you get what I'm saying? We are his witnesses. Galatians 2.20, just every time I read it, just knocks me out. It says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What, what, that, what that passage is saying is that God, through Jesus Christ, is living through us. We are his witnesses. We are, as some say, the continuing of the book of Acts, right? The story is still being written. Story still being written. I want to give you just a little bit of application before we close out. If you're grieved with what happened yesterday, as I am, you know, like, and this is not a time for politics or how you feel about a life could have been taken yesterday. And if you're a Christian, that should bother you, right? And then I even go a little further and say, you know, God sets up leaders. I truly believe that. Like, I know, like, we're like American and we like think our vote matters and all that stuff. I totally get it. But God is the one who places leaders at all times, at all times. You know, you know, when Nero was hanging Christians and was feeding them to lions in AD 60, when he was using, he had a really nice garden and he wanted to light it. So he would impale Christians and hang them up 
for it and burn them on fire so there'd be light through the walkway. You know, when he was on the throne, God was still on the throne. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So this is not a political situation. If, if you are grieved at what happened yesterday, first, it's a clear sign that times are going to get darker. And I was so burdened for you, you all last night. And I was praying that like, that this doesn't move us from the great work, the path that I believe that we've been on for the last two years of staying focused on the kingdom of God and what we have to do. I hope that doesn't move. I hope we're not moved from that. I hope we're reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I, I hope it does, though, motivate us to want to see people change and people see the error of their ways to see how the politics are, are how the, the, I'll just say it, the government is, is putting us against each other. I hope we can see Satan where he's in all of this. And I think the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. Um, I'll say this is also a call for us to be dependent on the power that's available to this. So if you're wondering like, well, what does that look like? Well, at first it starts with prayer. You're praying the Lord would fill you with power so you could witness you're praying that the Lord would convict you of sin, right? You're, there's, there's a, it's a prayerful life. You're praying the Lord would guide you into truth and direction for your life. The supernatural work that we're called to, man, it requires supernatural power. And the last two verses, I, I'm not going to skip them. I'm just, they're pretty clear. Verse 9 through 11 two men in white robes, what they do is they tell the disciples, the disciples are seeing Jesus ascend into heaven and these two men in white robes are standing next to them and they say, hey, snap out of it. That Jesus that ascended, he's coming back. So get to work. <laughs> so get to work. It's, it's wonderful. Stop worrying about his return and get to work. We're not obeying God just by complaining about how bad things are. We got to do something about it. And what do we do? What well, we love. We love God. We love people. We preach his word. We're patient. And no matter what happens now, no matter what happens in November, um, and I do believe that things are going to be worse. And I think that in the midst of darkness, the only light is going to be the church. But the church has to be ready. We have to be ready to give hope. I'll just end there. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for today. Um, I don't need to tell you how things are, you know. So, Father, you've given us a work to do in this community that you've placed us in and this time that you've placed us in. Oh, so, Father, I just pray you would empower us more. You've done so much, Father. It's us. We need to be in our word. We need to be to make a commitment to you, Father. Oh, that no matter what happens, we're not going to turn from you. We're not going to change your word, even if it costs us our lives. But Holy Spirit, I ask for your power to be with us, that embolden us, that we would be witnesses, that we would represent Christ all over this town, that we would represent you, Jesus, even when no one is looking, that we would be reminded that you are the God of the universe. Your eyes go to and fro. You see us even when no one else can see us, Father. I pray that would convict us so much to turn from sin. I pray for our congregation here as we're in different cities, most of us, and, and yet we, we live in a, 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 a state that um, does not like Christians and is doing everything it can to silence us, Father. And there's so many ways that we want to respond. Father, may you remind us that we are to come to you that we've already won the battle, that we are to be in tune with your spirit and listen to how you want us to move and how you want us to work. I pray for our members here. I pray for Christians here, but particularly the members here. I pray that they would, that you would just set a fire on them, that they would want to know what it is particularly you want them to do to help with the mission here at Open Door, that they would know their gifts, that they would, that they would know that they are needed, that we need each other to carry each other when we are weak, Father. Um, Father, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.